So Communist China has influence in the White House with the Biden family. Communist China has influence in the Senate with the Republican leadership with the McConnell family. China has a lot of power in our colleges and universities since it funds these Confucius Institutes, as we've talked about before. China is poisoning America, killing Americans through fentanyl. China is weaponizing our gangs with these devices that turn regular weapons into automatic weapons and on and on and on. This is where freedom rings. If you believe in America, if you believe in the Constitution, the Constitution empowers us. It's a new day. America's back. America's back and America's going to get strong again. We're going to defend America and we're going to defend our interests. Liberty's Voice, Levin TV. Hello, America. I'm Mark Levin, and this is Levin TV. Welcome. We have a great guest, special guest, Peter Schweitzer, for the full hour. The book is Blood Money, Why the Powerful Turn a Blind Eye While China Kills Americans. And this book is available right now on every platform, that is, every retail store, every internet store, Amazon.com. It's number one in the country, and it's number one for a reason. It's the substance. Peter Schweitzer, I want to welcome you and thank you. Blood money, there's a zillion topics out there. So when you're thinking and your team's thinking about doing research, writing a book and so forth and so on, you could pick from a, from a host, from a score of subjects. Why did you pick this one? Yeah, Mark, I don't know if I picked the topic or the topic picked me uh, in the sense that, you know, I've looked over the last five years in our country and I've just seen a lot of tumult, uh, a lot of violence in the streets, uh, a lot of violent protests, uh, you know, all of these sort of uh, crazy ideologies developing the whole trans movement. Uh, I see the rise of, of drug deaths in the United States and I wanted to try to figure out what was going on. How has my country changed? And of course, there's not one single answer, uh, but I wanted to look at this question in the context of how China operates strategically. Um, they have this strategy called disintegration warfare that they formalized in 2010. And what I see is that it's playing out. A, a lot of the things that trouble me, a lot of things that I think have troubled you that you talk about on your uh, platforms, uh, are connected with China's strategy. And so I thought it was important to highlight that because we are spending a lot of time in this country and there are legitimate divisions between us. We're spending a lot of our time pointing the finger at each other. I think part of what's going on in this country is China is engaging in activities to amplify our divisions or to give voice to radical ideas that are a really a pretty small minority of the American people, but they get amplified. And then, of course, the leaders in Washington, D.C., uh, the Democrat leaders embrace it. So that's really I kind of backed into this topic, um, but it's based on this concern about what I'm seeing in 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 my country on a daily basis. So you decide you're going to take a look at this or it decides it's going to take a look at you and how long does it take you to organize the research project that goes behind the writing of the book? There's an enormous amount of uh, endnotes for the purpose of not only defending everything you have in the book, for if people want to look it up, they can. Tell us a little bit about the project. How does it work and how long does it take? Yeah, usually the entire process is two years uh, and the research is a year and a half. Um, and, you know, I have a research team, uh, 12 to 13 researchers who work full time on these issues. They all have different areas of expertise. Uh, we uh, subscribe to some very uh, expensive but valuable data sets that allow you to track commercial relationships around the world. Some of these are used by uh, Homeland Security and other government agencies. Uh, and you just start to dig in. So, you know, in the case of blood money, there's kind of two sides to this story, Mark. One is what is China doing to us? So you have a group of researchers who are focused on how China operates overseas. What are their relationships in Me Mexico? How, the, how are they involved in the fentanyl trade? Let's get specific and be granular and name names. So one research team is focusing on that. But the second part of the story is how are our leaders responding or failing to respond what China is doing? And then the question becomes, why 
are they failing? Why are they falling short? So you start to look at their commercial relationships and ties with China. That could be the Bidens, that could be Mitch McConnell, that could be Gavin Newsom. So what you're doing is, I, I, the analogy I use with the researchers market is kind of like drilling oil. You know, I'm not an oil man, but I know people in the oil business. And they look for certain geological formations. They think there might be oil there. They, they drill a test well. And if they find oil, they drill long and they drill deep and they hope they find a gusher. The research here is very, very similar. You look for patterns, you look for connections, you're hoping you do a drill well, you hope that there's something there. Sometimes there's not and you move on. But when you find a gusher, boy, you drill long and you drill deep and you try to get as much granular information as possible. And so this all takes a very long time and then the last six months or so is the actual writing process of the book, which I know you write your own books. To me, honestly, that's my least favorite part of the process. I love the research. I love the discovery. You agonize over every word when you write a book. Um, but of course, you have to do that to con convey the information that you've collected. Now, before we get into the center of the book, let's go to the end here, which is, and I ask you this every time, and there's a pattern here, I fear. You are not invited on most media platforms uh, that we would used to call mainstream. Now we consider them Democrat Party platforms. You're not asked to come on Meet the Press or Face the Nation. You're not asked to come on um, these morning shows that are kind of dressed up as cook happy shows, but still they push their news events and so forth. You're not asked to come on these Sunday shows. Have you been asked to go on any Sunday show? Uh, I'm not talking about mine, obviously, but any Sunday show that sort of claims to be a newsy show? <laughs> Other than uh, the Fox Network, no. And, and here's the thing, Mark. I mean, you and I have known each other for a long time. I'm doing what I did 10, 15 years ago, and I used to do all those shows. I mean, I did Good Morning America. I've done CBS This Morning. Uh, I did, you know, Anderson Cooper on CNN. Uh, I did, you know, ABC News. I did George Stephanopoulos. I did 60 Minutes several times. Um, but the problem is I haven't changed. I'm doing what I've always done. The networks have changed. Um, and it's really a function of a couple of things. I think number one is when Donald Trump, uh, you know, ran for the presidency and actually won, it, it really startled the establishment media. It kind of shook them to their core. Uh, and they immediately changed from being what they claimed to be, which was sort of a neutral arbitrator. We all know that they had a liberal bias, but at least they felt the need to cover the important news that was coming out, even within conservative circles. They completely changed. They now view themselves as part of the resistance. And so they don't want to cover my stuff, particularly as it pertains to the Bidens, because they believe that somehow if I am accurately reporting information on the Biden family, it is aiding and abetting uh, Donald Trump or Trump forces uh, that are against Joe Biden. So their response is to sort of cover it up. So it's a tragedy. I think they've further trashed their brands. People see what's going on. Uh, but those are the realities uh, in which we operate. Uh, the bottom line, as you know, is information fills a vacuum. People hunger for this stuff. My book still hit number one on the New York Times bestseller list. Um, so I don't need those outlets, but I sure wish that the audiences that, that you know, watch those outlets had access to this information as well. It's called Blood Money. This is the book. It's a fantastic book. I read it front to back. I learned an enormous amount of information. You get it at Amazon.com, ladies and gentlemen. Any of my platforms, any retail store should have it as well. Now let's jump in. When you were doing the research and your folks were doing the research, obviously people need to understand 95% of the materials you come up with don't make it in the book. So you go through all these materials, you're editing it, you're deciding really what's paramount. What do people need to know? And when you went through that process and you got to the peak, is there any one thing and we'll get into these chapters in a minute, but is there any one thing that really stood out as you were writing it and then finished it and then it went to publishing? 
I'd say there are probably two things. Um, I know you asked for one, but I'm going to have to uh, offer Doesn't matter. two. <laughs> the first one was the Biden family financial entanglements with China. We talked about that before on your programs. We've broken those stories together. And people know if they read my book and watch your programs that the Biden's got some $30 million from Chinese businessmen. I was shocked to discover, based on the research in this book, that money that they got, at least five million of it, uh, came from a businessman who was business partners with one of the Chinese criminal gang leaders who helped set up the fentanyl crisis in Mexico. So what that means, Mark, is the first family of the United States has literally one degree of separation from the criminal networks uh, that are poisoning 100,000 Americans every year. That was pretty stunning to me. Uh, we're not just talking about sleazy uh, businessmen in China. We're talking about those that are criminally involved in killing Americans. Um, so that was the first one. I think the second one really threw me for a loop. Um, we stumbled across the fact that there are two Chinese-based billionaires, one an American who now lives in China, who's friends with the CCP, the other one a bona fide Chinese businessman, these two billionaires are two of the biggest funders of the trans movement in the United States. That shocked me. I didn't expect to find that. Um, and then to find out furthermore that those two individuals, uh, Mark, aren't advocating for these positions in China itself. Um, that led me to the conclusion, which I think is amply supported, that that is part of this disruptive strategy uh, that China has to sow chaos and confusion in the United States. Uh, I didn't expect to find um, that specificity of the sort of actions they're taking in our country. All right, let's get into some of this. Uh, very, very important. The border, as you know, is a major issue in this country, and it should be, with the drug cartels, the slavery that's taking place, not just sex slavery, labor slavery, just slavery, like we've never seen in this country since the era of slavery. This is a purposeful policy of Joe Biden's, and he's going to go down to the border, and he's going to say it's Trump's fault and the Republicans' fault. If they only would have passed my legislation, this would all be fixed. But you make it clear as you read through the book and some of your statements now, no, that's not right. In many ways, the Biden family is bought and paid for by the communist Chinese. So they'll criticize them to a point. They'll do something to a point. But they're not going to do something really to uh, rock the boat because the Chinese may have a lot of information on the Biden family that the Biden family doesn't want public, no? No, you're, you're exactly right, Mark. And I'll give a very specific, vivid example um, I have a section in the book at the beginning, as you know, about fentanyl uh, and China's involvement um, in every link in the chain of, of fentanyl reaching the United States. In early 2021, there was a congressional commission that reported to the Biden administration, to the White House, that there are 2,000 Chinese nationals just south of the border, just south of the U.S. border in Mexico, in a small town, 2,000 Chinese nationals that are helping the Mexican cartels create fentanyl to smuggle across the border. This came out in early 2021. That report was issued by this congressional commission. And guess what? The Biden administration said, we're going to open up the border anyway. Uh, that to me um, is the epitome of negligence, criminal negligence, because what you're essentially saying is, we know this is a systematic effort. We know that fentanyl is coming. We know that tens of thousands of Americans are dying every year. People that don't even know they're taking fentanyl, it's taking our best and our brightest. And our agenda is more important than actually protecting the American people. Um, so, you know, Joe Biden is not going to do anything to challenge the Chinese. He refuses to even confront them verbally about what they're doing with the fentanyl trade. The last time he talked to President Xi, he said he brought it up, but there was no finger pointing, um, which is just an outrageously ridiculous thing to say. Uh, and his secretary of state has even claimed that well, some of the precursors, chemical precursors coming from China that go to create fentanyl probably were sent by the Chinese by accident. Um, this is the kind of ludicrous um, comments that we're getting out of this administration. Meanwhile, China continues to kill 100,000 Americans every year. Fentanyl poisoning is now the leading cause of death in the United States for people under the age of 45. 
and Joe Biden doesn't even want to mention it or confront the Chinese about it. Let me put it in my way. What you seem to be suggesting here is that Joe Biden is one of the greatest facilitators of the sale and use of fentanyl in the United States of America, given his policies, number one. And he's also one of the greatest, as the left calls them, slavers in American history, given his border policies and the fact that unknown infinite numbers of women and children are being sold into sex slavery and pornography, and he doesn't lift a finger to stop it. In fact, he does nothing except open the border and allow it. Have I overstated the case? If you look at the human cost of the open border, human cost to Americans, human cost to women and children, uh, the, the body count is astronomical. Uh, it's, it's fentanyl, uh, but it's also um, other things that are uh, coming across the border as well. I mean, I, I talk in the book about uh, these devices, they're called Glock switches. Um, it's about the size of a quarter, it's not very big, but it's a device that if you put it into a Glock handgun, it turns it into a fully automatic machine gun. Uh, now, I'm a huge Second Amendment advocate. I actually have a federal permit to actually own a legitimate uh, machine gun, so I love the Second Amendment. But what's going on here, Mark, is the Chinese are smuggling these across the border from Mexico into the United States, and our government says they are specifically targeting these devices to criminal gangs in the United States, drug dealers, gang leaders, with the design purpose to sow violent chaos on America's streets. And the rate of machine gun fire in the United States over the last five years has gone up more than 5,000% uh, in America's cities. Um, you can go on YouTube and, and simply search for Glock switch police, and you are going to see horrific videos of police officers across the United States driving down the street, and suddenly they're subjected to machine gun fire. And these are gang members using these Glock switches that are being produced in Mexico with China's help and being smuggled across the border into the United States, into the open border. So... It's fentanyl, it's the slavery, it's the sex trafficking, it's Glock switches. It is a horrible brew that is killing and poisoning all sorts of people and Joe Biden is not doing anything about it. I want the public to know that's watching this and I wanna go through some of these chapters so people get a real flavor of this. The book is Blood Money, Why the Powerful Turn a Blind Eye While China Kills Americans. And you don't leave any stone unturned. You don't leave any politician unscathed. In the Opium Wars, you're talking about China's foot soldiers, willful blindness, arming criminals that you've just talked about, magnifying social chaos, which we'll get into, destabilizing democracy. I think those are linked. The TikTok bomb, and we now know that Joe Biden's embraced TikTok. And there's so many other good pieces in here, but I want to hit this TikTok thing just to demonstrate that this is not just Democrats, although that's a huge problem. But TikTok has investors. Tell us about one of those investors. Yeah, you're right. I mean, there are a lot of Democrats that defend TikTok, uh, but you also see it on the right. There's a, a investor in Pennsylvania, Jeff Yass, he owns an investment firm that owns a large stake. The estimate is between 17 and 20 percent of uh, ByteDance, which is the parent company of TikTok. And he also happens to be a big donor for the to the Club for Growth, uh, which generally I've supported their positions in the past. But the Club for Growth, Mark, has now come out against doing anything against TikTok. Um, and I think the reason is that this TikTok investor in the United States is one of the biggest donors to the Club for Growth. And they're putting pressure on congressional uh, Republicans and, and Republicans in the Senate to oppose taking any action on ByteDance. And just to be clear, so everybody knows, you know, ByteDance, the parent company of TikTok, they are involved in joint ventures on artificial intelligence with the Chinese Ministry of State Security. I talk about in the book that the senior ranks of this company are all occupied by CCP members, by people that used to work for the Ministry of Propaganda in China. 
I quote from Chinese officials describing how, in their words, TikTok is a Trojan horse that they're using against the United States. They describe how they use TikTok to manipulate young people emotionally in the West. It's, mm. it's if you've got children, it's, it's I think, gut-wrenching uh, to read. So we're having this, you know, debate in the United States. Oh, are there security concerns about TikTok? Oh, might China use TikTok against us? They're not having this debate in China. They're already doing it and they're explicit about it. And you would expect that support for this from people on the political left. They seem to be sympathetic uh, to China, people like Joe Biden. But you're also seeing it on the right because of the role that this investor uh, plays. And the estimates are that ByteDance may be a trillion dollar company, which would mean that this investment firm with this donor uh, could be sitting on $200 billion uh, of equity in this company. So they have a lot of money to lose and they are throwing it around the Capitol trying to make sure that action is not taken against uh, TikTok. This is what money does, whether it's communist China, whether it's Qatar, whether it's Saudi Arabia. And I want to ask you about that. I can't remember another time, certainly not in the 30s and 40s, when countries were literally buying organizations, spreading their money around, buying our colleges and universities, buying politicians and ex-politicians, the extent to which it's taking place today. You do this research, your folks do this research, your books have a common theme, and that is this, this nightmarish corruption that's taking place in the federal government that's getting bigger and bigger and more and more powerful, and the public has no idea who's doing what to whom and who's paying whom and so forth. Have you ever seen anything like this in, in, as you've gone through history? Have you looked at this where so many people and institutions are on the take, not just by foreign governments, but by enemy foreign governments? Uh, no, Mark, I haven't. Um, and look, this is something the founders warned about. They warned about, they were, of course, mostly concerned about Great Britain, but they worried about elected officials being given con you know, commercial opportunities in order to persuade them. And, you know, I've been doing this for a long time. I think the real turning point, honestly, on this issue was Bill and Hillary Clinton and the Clinton Foundation. You had instances in the past, you remember Billy Carter and the, and, and the Libyans and uh, George H.W. Bush had a brother, Prescott Bush, who would, you know, was doing some deals in China back in the early 90s. But it was really the Clintons that turbocharged this. Uh, when Bill Clinton started accepting $750,000 to speak for 20 minutes uh, overseas, everybody realized these weren't speaking fees. These were bribes disguised as speaking fees. And then the Clinton Foundation, they're accepting these $10 million donations while Hillary Clinton is Secretary of State from foreign governments. That really turbocharged it. And the problem is, Mark, that if this stuff is allowed to happen, uh, Washington, D.C. is a town where, you know, imitation happens all the time. If the Clintons get away with it, and they largely did, other people are going to start doing the same thing. And you start to see that. And so I think the Bidens uh, are even more blatant and direct about it than the Clintons were. Um, and the scale of personal enrichment, when you look at the Bidens, the fact that we're not talking about taking money from the Japanese. We're not talking about money taking money from the UK. We're going to actually go to Russia and China, and that's going to be our business model. And you've got Democrats on Capitol Hill defending this behavior. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't think I'd ever see that. I, I was naive enough to think once this was exposed that uh, we were going to see Democrats say, wait a minute, this is too much. We can't do this. Uh, but unfortunately, we haven't. So it's it's going to get worse until enough people in Washington are prepared to stand up and say, no, we're not tolerating this anymore. This goes beyond the pale. It has to stop. Let's dig in a little bit more here. The army that the communist Chinese effectively is creating in our own country. Uh, we see it through our colleges and universities. They in Qatar are spending more money to brainwash our children than any other countries. There are others, too. You can see the influence in the streets, the, the river to the sea crowd, the influence in Dearborn, Michigan. You can see the influence in our tenured professors. 
the administrators of these different schools and so forth. I call it this Marxist-Islamist access because they all hate America. They want to destroy America, and if America is destroyed, they'll duke it out among themselves after the fact, you know, like Trotsky and Stalin. But here we are, um, and China's obviously building into that. When you look at this, when you look at the influence that China has, and you realize, well, China's not alone, but they are the, the tip of the spear. Do you get down about the country? Do you think we can work our way out of this? Uh, it is a daunting challenge, is it not? It is a daunting challenge, but um, look, I, I love this country. I love the people in this country. And I want to believe that when people are alerted to this, um, they are going to become so angry and outraged. They are going to elect their, let their elected officials know, and they're going to vote. Uh, they're going to vote on these issues. My favorite figure during the American War to Independence was Paul Revere. I just thought as a young kid, I thought it's so great. This guy got to ride a horse, shouting in the middle of the night, alerting people, the British are coming, the British are coming. That, and I think that, peer, that spirit is still here. But I think that, you know, the media is trying to ignore these stories. But when you start to look at some of the opinion polls that are coming out, you know, from uh, Harvard Harris and ABC News and The New York Times on the Hunter Biden issue, you and I first talked about that in 2018. All of those polls now show that when asked, do you believe that Joe Biden engaged in either illegal or highly unethical behavior to benefit his family commercially? More than 65% in every single survey say, yes, they believe that he did. Um, that's a huge sea change, huge sea true, change from true. where we were in 2020. So people do care about these issues. Um, the reason I do this is because I love my country and I have to, at some level, be an optimist and believe that things will turn around. I'm sure that's the reason you get up and do what you do every day. You have to believe that victory can be achieved or otherwise, why do this? When people ask me the question if I'm an optimist or a pessimist, my answer for years has been this. When George Patton was told and directed to move his army as fast as he could to the Battle of the Bolt or we would might lose the war, and he didn't have enough gasoline and he had to do it in a relative few days, he wasn't sitting around thinking about whether he was a pessimist or an optimist. He got off his ass and he did something about it. Yeah. And that's what I try and tell people, even though I ask the question, it doesn't matter. Either you want to fight to save your country or we're going to lose it. It's really that simple. We just got word, Peter Schweitzer, that Mitch McConnell is going to step down as the leader in November. I suspect he really didn't have any choice uh, because you'd have more senators coming in uh, unless the Republicans have a completely disastrous election. Uh, the numbers suggest that they ought to at least have a majority. I mean, the vast majority of seats that are up are Democrat seats. It's that simple. Uh, in some cases, you should be able to run a potato head and get them elected. But that said, he's the longest serving leader of either party in the United States Senate. He announces he's going to step down from that position in November, perhaps because he would have been pushed out anyway, or maybe because he's just not that happy with conservatives and he's stressed out. But this is a man who has spent not only his life in politics, but he married into a family that is enormously wealthy. Can you remind Americans, how did that family become enormously wealthy? And what has Mitch McConnell done to lead the Republicans to take on this, uh, this, this, this vile enemy, communist China? Yeah, he hasn't done much. Uh, and the reason, I would say there's millions of reasons he has not done that. That's because the family's wealth is tied up with communist China. He's married to Elaine Chao, of course, who served in the Trump administration and the George W. Bush administration. But if you go back to 1993, uh, he and Elaine Chao are married. They take a trip to China. Uh, this is only a few years after Tiananmen Square. Very few, if any, American politicians are going to China. But Mitch McConnell, senator from Kentucky, goes with Elaine Chao and with his father-in-law. They're there as guests of the Chinese State Shipbuilding Corporation, which is the biggest military contractor in China. Uh, and what they basically do is strike a bargain. Uh, the Chow family has a shipping company. They have those big tankers, you know, that go across the Pacific and ship goods. 
And what the Chinese State Shipbuilding Corporation basically said to the Chow family and to Mitch McConnell is, look, we tell you what, we'll strike you a bargain. We will build those large ships for you. We'll actually even finance the construction of those ships for you. We'll provide crews to man those ships so you won't have to worry about personnel. And we'll have our state-owned companies use your ships to ship our goods across the Pacific to the United States and to the ends of the world. Um, that was a huge win. And the size of foremost shipping, the Chow family business, you know, just exploded over the next several decades. The problem is, Mark, it made Mitch McConnell a lot of money. Personally, his father-in-law uh, about 10, 15 years ago gave him a gift of between five and $25 million. So Mitch McConnell personally benefited from the growth of that business. The problem is with all of that money came a dependence on China. Foremost shipping, if the Chinese government were to say, we refuse to do any more business with you, it would destroy the child family business overnight. Mitch McConnell knows that. And if you look at his positions on China's involvement with fentanyl, if you look at his position on what they're doing in the South China Sea, on human rights, et cetera, he will say a few things, but not too much, and he will do nothing to confront China. And it is because China has them exactly where they want him, which is dependent upon them financially. Uh, and so I think the fact that he is leaving uh, is hopefully gonna give an opportunity for a Republican that takes his place to take a much stronger and more bold position with regards to China. So Communist China has influence in the White House with the Biden family. Communist China has influence in the Senate with the Republican leadership with the McConnell family. China has a lot of power in our colleges and universities since it funds these Confucius Institutes, as we've talked about before. Uh, China is poisoning America killing Americans through fentanyl. China is weaponizing our gangs with these devices that turn regular weapons into automatic weapons, and on and on and on. The book is Blood Money. I encourage you to get it, Amazon.com, any major bookstore, any online bookstore. I wouldn't wait. I'd get it, and I would read it. Now, we have a man in waiting a so-called Democrat presidential candidate in waiting who makes Slick Willie look unslick. And that would be gruesome Gavin Newsom. Now, Gavin Newsom destroyed the city of San Francisco. He's destroyed a state financially. It is insanity in that state with the wokeism, with the legislation they passed, the redistribution of wealth, the attack on private property rights, the attack on, on uh, you name it, the combustion engine. There's nothing they won't attack. But this guy has his own issues with communist China, doesn't he? He does. Uh, he's soft on communist China. Since 2016, uh, fentanyl poisonings in California have gone up more than 1,200%. Uh, but he will not call out China. He will not confront China. He will not name China as being involved in pushing this fentanyl in the United States. In fact, he took a trip uh, a little bit ago to China where he again, echoing Joe Biden, said, I mentioned fentanyl to them, but there was no finger pointing. Um, and this is really bizarre to me. Uh, he's, he takes this very strong pro-Beijing position. And what you realize is that he has these ties to China as well. They go back to his uh, time as the mayor of San Francisco, where he literally surrounded himself with individuals who were members of Chinese organized crime networks that were involved in the drug trade. Um, so he appointed a guy named Alan Lung as the head of the development for Chinatown in San Francisco. Lung ended up being a dragon head in Chinese organized crime, which is a leader, a uh, criminal leader in organized crime. Gavin Newsom became friends with this so-called reformed organized crime figure named Shrimp Boy. He actually, uh, his office, Gavin Newsom's office, sent money to this guy's nonprofit. Turned out he wasn't reformed. He was actually involved in criminal activity, including drug dealing and a murder for hire plot in China. As mayor of San Francisco, he had another gentleman named Keith Jackson on his transition team, who was also tied to Chinese organized crime. And then when he set up something called China SF, which was an initiative by him as mayor to bring Chinese investment dollars into the Bay Area, he chose of all the businessmen in China, 
a guy named Vincent Lowe, who as I outline in Blood Money, has deep abiding ties to Chinese organized crime going back decades. And it was known at the time when Gavin Newsom picked him that he was linked to Chinese organized crime. And as a result of that, Chinese companies linked to, to organized crime got a gateway and became active in the San Francisco Bay Area. So Gavin Newsom does not want to have a conversation about fentanyl. He does not want to have a conversation about Chinese criminal activity in the United States because he was neck deep in it as mayor. And some of those ties continue to this day. So terrible. And he's he's in line for the Democrat nomination should Biden trip or whatever. Uh, what's going on in this country? And then you have Adam Schiff who spent years trying to take down Donald Trump and create a lie about Russia collusion. He lied repeatedly. Now he wants to be a senator. He has a shot at being a senator from the state of California. And he's tied to the communist Chinese, too, is he not? You know, he was the chairman of the Intelligence Committee when he was going after Donald Trump with allegations of Russia collusion. During his tenure as chairman, he did not have one hearing. He did not issue one report as a committee chairman on the fentanyl crisis, even though in his own district, Fentanyl poisonings went up 1,200 percent during that time period. Uh, if you look at uh, uh, his website, his congressional website, he never talks about China's involvement in the fentanyl crisis. Uh, and part of the reason is that he has some of these links as well that I talked about with Gavin Newsom. Uh, he became friends with a gentleman named Adnan Kawaja, who lived in his district. He had a company called Allied Wallet. Kawaja and executives from his company gave Adam Schiff more than $100,000 in campaign contributions in 2016. He introduced Adam Schiff to a Saudi prince who was a friend of his. Well, it turns out that Kawaja, when he was donating the money to Adam Schiff, was already under FBI investigation. Adam Schiff knew that. And Kawaja was later charged by the FBI with money laundering, including money laundering involving criminal gangs from China that are involved in the drug trade. So again, Adam Schiff does not want to have a conversation about this issue. He wants it to go away, even though people in his district are being poisoned pretty much every day because of this fentanyl that's arriving from China. You know, in the past, just to link this together, you've talked about at some length Eric Swalwell, but it just shows the extent to which the communist Chinese are pushing every button they possibly can, whether it's academia, whether it's uh, our technologies, whether it's our governing system, whether it's the health of the American people. You see Swalwell, how he had an affair with a Chinese spy. But one of the big things you talk about in the book also is the COVID virus and how that came to pass and how so many in our government didn't want to blame communist China. Explain that. We got access to some of Tony Fauci's uh, emails, uh, of course, through the Freedom of Information Act. And what you find is that Tony Fauci and his aides were doing everything possible to cover up for the Chinese. And the problem is, COVID is not just a problem from China because that's where the virus originated. I believe it was a lab leak. I think the evidence is overwhelming. But once they realized that the virus was out there, the Chinese government took actions, Mark, to maximize the body count in the United States. There was a two month period where they knew that the virus was transmitted from person to person. Uh, but they lied to us and to the world and said, no, it does not transfer from person to person. During that two month period, they cornered the market on PPE supplies that, that medical personnel use when they're treating seriously ill people. So when we finally realized what we were dealing with, it was too late. The Trump administration scrambled trying to find these supplies, but China had all of them because they had gobbled them all up in the preceding two months. Um, the response of Tony Fauci in his emails, and I quote him extensively, was to always make excuse for the Chinese. Uh, in fact, there was even an email exchange that he had with a New York Times reporter who, in the spring of 2020, Mark, was explaining how gallant the Chinese were in dealing with COVID, that they were so courageous in their response. And he contrasted that with sort of the fat pigs in America who are selfish and fighting for themselves and they don't have the cooperative spirit that the Chinese do. 
Tony Fauci agreed with him. He said, yeah, no, you make a really good point here. Uh, in other words, he was much more enamored with the top-down authoritarian approach that the Chinese took than standing up for the American people who, in their individualism, we're dealing with the virus the way that we traditionally have, which is locking down or, or encouraging people that are sick to stay home, but everybody else goes by their normal life. That's the way we usually dealt with viruses, but we adopted China's model because of Chinese efforts to manipulate us uh, that were successful, especially in states like California and New Jersey, where, Mark, they actually donated, the Chinese actually donated to California, the state of California, 100 drones. And those were used by law enforcement in California to monitor whether people were actually abiding by lockdowns. I mean, this is like an Orwellian mm -hmm. uh, sort of action on the part of California. Uh, and they adopted it because the Chinese manipulated us into believing that their approach was the proper way to respond. The book is Blood Money. You can get it at Amazon.com, any major bookstore. It's out right now. It's number one on Amazon for a reason. It's because what's between the covers. And when you look, Peter Schweitzer, at these various companies that are doing business with Communist China, I mean, the question becomes which companies aren't, not which companies are. There was a time in our history when companies were patriotic. They wouldn't do business the Third Reich, obviously Japan after they attacked us and so forth and so on. The question becomes, when Kissinger said we need to open up to China, bring them into our capitalist system and so forth, seems to me we've come into their system and they're able to destroy certain of our corporations, they're able to blackmail. Uh, you even have the NBA and others uh, where these players speak out for civil liberties. They claim to, except of course when it comes to China and their profits and their sneakers. This is going to be very, very difficult to reverse, isn't it? It is, uh, because a lot of the powerful por forces in this country that have economic power and political power don't want to change to the status quo. Uh, you're exactly right, Mark. The bargain we made with China going back to the early 90s was if we engage with them economically, they're going to become more like us. Uh, the sad fact is, is we're, we become more like them. Uh, we are now censoring ourselves, or at least large companies are censoring themselves because they don't want to offend China. Uh, I have a chapter in the book on Hollywood uh, and how the Hollywood studios in this mad rush to get Chinese money, to get access to the Chinese market, give the Chinese Ministry of Propaganda veto power over what is in films um, and, and with some really shocking results. Uh, and the problem is that what these companies will say is, well, we're just doing this because we, it's the bottom line profit, uh, where, of course, they don't make the same argument when it comes to these diversity issues. Then it's all about doing the right thing. But when it comes to China, it's no longer about doing the right thing. Um, we are going to reach a day of reckoning in this country, I think, where this is going to become the core question upon which our future pivots. Uh, and that is, are we going to allow American elites to continue to do this? Because let's face it, Mark, these large companies that do business deals with China and who say we aren't American companies anymore, uh, when their bacon's in the fryer, when their employees are held hostage overseas, are they calling the UN? Are they calling the Chinese? They're calling the United States government, expecting them to help them. If they're having a problem, a legal problem internationally, they're expecting our criminal justice system to help them. So we need to remind them, no, you are American companies and we don't have a problem with you operating overseas. But when it leads you to help our enemies, when it leads you to undermine our principles, then it's gone too far. And I think that day of reckoning is coming. Let's remember when Donald Trump enacted tariffs on the Chinese when he was president of the United States. The Chinese did not go to Washington, D.C. to lobby the Trump administration. They went to Silicon Valley, they went to Wall Street, and they said, you guys go and lobby the Trump administration. And those industries dutifully did. That's what's going on in the country, and that has to change. And that has to change, and I agree with that. You mentioned Hollywood in the few minutes we have left, but it's more than Hollywood, isn't it? It's our mass media. These are major international corporations, most of whom do business 
Look at NBC, owned by Comcast, and the Olympics. They were not allowed to say anything negative about communist China, and they didn't. All throughout the Olympics, they didn't say a word. So our media are corrupt when it comes to communist China. Our entertainment industry is corrupt. Uh, much of our broadcast industry is corrupt. We have politicians who are corrupt, government officials who are corrupt, right into the White House and so forth and so on. Um, it, it, it really is daunting. But let's just quickly, in the few minutes we have left, let's talk about the American media. They do have ties to communist China because they're now owned most of these platforms by these massive conglomerates, no? That's exactly right. Uh, Disney obviously owns ABC. Disney does a lot of business in China. Disney changes content in its films so they don't offend China. Um, same thing with uh, uh, NBC. Um, you've got Universal, of course, which has, uh, you know, uh, theme parks. They want to do business in China. You look at an outfit like the New York Times, partly owned by Carlos Slim. Carlos Slim has investments in China. Uh, the list goes on and on and on. And the problem is, Mark, is that if these entities were being consistent and telling us all the time it's about the bottom line. I guess you could say, okay, I don't agree with them, but at least they're being consistent. The problem is these are the very institutions, including academe, that lecture us all the time on some perceived or claimed moral authority, whether it's race issues, whether it's economic issues, whether it's quote unquote equity issues. They lecture us with a certain moralism because they deem themselves to be these moral actors. Well, the great issue of our time is China, whether it's human rights, whether it's fentanyl, whether it's the things that are going on around the world, slavery, um, it is China. And on that issue, the most important, largest issue where you're actually talking about human lives, these voices are absolutely silent. So I think we need to remind them and we need to remind our friends, these organizations, these entities have zero moral authority because it's as if somebody, you know, during the 1850s in the United States was lecturing and sermonizing, but didn't want to say a thing about slavery. Mm -hmm. uh, nobody would take them seriously in their moralism, and we should not take these entities serious in any of their moralizing either. Peter Schweitzer, it's always an honor. We learn so much. Your books are fantastic. You can see all the work that goes into them. You are a great patriot. That's why you want to convey this information to as many people as possible. The book is Blood Money, Why the Powerful Turn a Blind Eye While China Kills Americans. You can get it at Amazon.com, any major bookstore. I encourage you to get it right now. It's number one on Amazon for a reason. Even this hour that we've spent together isn't enough time to go through what is actually in this book. And uh, it really is a rare investigative journalist these days to really point a spotlight at these, these activities. It's always an honor to have you, Peter Schweitzer. God bless you. Take care of yourself. Thank you, Mark. You're more than welcome. See you next time on Levin TV.